Okay, it is open and it is being recorded. Great. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us tonight for our third public meeting regarding the replacement of the Tilden Environmental Education Center. I'm Sarah Federley. I'm the supervising naturalist here at the Tilden Nature Area and one of your hosts for the evening. Uh, while we wait for people to join in, uh, we would love to have you participate in a poll that pops up on your screen. Uh, if you have been here to some of the previous um, meetings, you may uh, see some repeat questions, but we would love it if you would answer those again so we can get an idea um, of who's here and how and to continue gathering information uh, that will help guide us in the development of this pro of this project. I also wanted to let you know that this session is being recorded. You can review this meeting and get a closer look at the slides by going to the East Bay Regional Parks Tilden Environmental Education Center EEC Replacement Projects page at ebparks.org. And you can click on one of the YouTube videos um, for previous meetings or for this meeting. A summary of this phase of the design will also be on display at the current Tilden Environmental Education Center. So I invite you to stop in and view that and enjoy the park and the programs while you're there. There's eight questions in this poll. All right, feel free to jump in. And again, for those of you just joining us now, I'm Sarah Federley, Supervising Naturalist for the Tilden Nature Area. And it is my great pleasure to welcome you to this, the third community meeting for the replacement of the Tilden Environmental Education Center. The wonderful visitor center that is the information and education hub for the Tilden Nature Area. I see we have some repeat people who have um, attended these meetings in the past. And um, several are visiting the park with children. We ask, when was the last time you visited the Tilden Nature Center? And there's been people that uh, were here in the last week or within the last month. So that's fabulous. We have uh, definitely people from the local community that are visiting here tonight. I thought this was an interesting question. Have any of the following circumstances created a barrier to you for accessing the current visitor center? Let's see what responses come in. So far, there has not been any barriers. And this is really an opportunity for you to give us input. So we asked some questions this time um, about uh, things that you would like to see in a visitor center. What are the features you would like to see? What are you interested in learning in the visitor center? So please um, put, put some uh, good information in there for us. Uh, 
I see I should have put in all of the above on that. What would you like to, what are you interested in learning in? A lot of people answering many of those things. Beautiful. Well, we've done a great deal of work thus far on this project, and we've reached an exciting point in our planning process, which we'll be sharing with you this evening. I also want to thank all the members of the public who have contributed to this process thus far by attending these meetings, by commenting on the web page, and helping us reimagine what uh, this EEC, this Environmental Education Center, uh, can be. We deeply appreciate the input and I hope that you will continue to offer your comments and questions and hopes and dreams for the Visitor Center um, by putting it in the Q&A tonight or in the chat um, or by uh, visiting our link to the project page and putting your input in there. But before we jump into the introductions, I would like to respectfully acknowledge that this project is taking place on the unceded ancestral lands of the Huchin Ohlone people. I ask that you join me in honoring this beautiful land and the people who have cared for it since time immemorial and continue to, to remain deeply connected to it today. Now it's my pleasure to introduce you to Amanda Sanders, who will go over some of the logistics for this webinar. Thank you, Sarah. Welcome everyone. We are glad to have you tonight. Uh, those of you that are new and those of you who have attended our previous meetings. I just wanted to go over some of the Zoom uh, features that we'll be using during this meeting. If you look at the bottom of your screen, uh, there's a, a toolbar that has a bunch of different icons. We will be using the Q&A um, uh, the Q&A button to, uh, to have you go ahead and send in questions to the panelists. And when you send them in, all of the panelists can see them. If it's, uh, we can either answer them by writing out an answer. And if they do that, it'll go over to the answered side uh, where it, when then everybody can read the answers to the question. Or um, we can, we'll be, after each different section of the presentation, we'll be taking um, some time to read out questions out loud and getting a live answer uh, from the panelists. Uh, we ask that you don't uh, use the raise hand button during the, the meeting. Um, and that if you have a, a direct question for somebody, you can use the chat function um, and you will only be able to send to the the hosts and the panelists um, but again we, we ask that you don't send questions to panelists who are uh, actively speaking because it's a little bit distracting to have notifications popping up when you're trying to give a presentation um, and uh, just so you know why we're not having uh, our attendees give uh, questions live. Um, it, it's just because uh, we want to be able to provide a high quality meeting to you all and to not have any uh, distracting and possibly to um, uh, un uncouth uh, behavior on, uh, on the call uh, to keep it a safe and respectable uh, place for everybody. If you have any questions, feel free to send me a message. And uh, thank you again for joining. If you haven't had a chance to answer the poll, uh, go ahead and do that now. Um, and after our next introduction, we'll uh, go over the results. Great, thank you, Amanda. Uh, now I'd like to introduce one of the very multi-talented naturalists that are here at Tilden Nature Area. Martha Serta, who will provide Spanish translation services for the meeting. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Sarah. 
Uh, happy to be here. Buenas tardes, me llamo Marta Cerda y soy naturalista con el Distrito de Parques Regional del Este de la Bahía en Tilden Nature Area. Esta es la tercera de tres reuniones comunitarias para aprender sobre el proyecto de sustitución del Centro de Educación Medioambiental de Tilden Nature Area y saber un poco del progreso, progreso del proyecto. Estoy aquí para traducir cualquier pregunta que puedan tener. La presentación no va a ser traducida, pero pueden hacer sus preguntas en español en la sección de Q&A y ahí estaré respondiendo. También me pueden mandar sus preguntas en la opción del chat abajito en su pantalla. Muchas gracias por estar aquí y por su participación. En realidad queremos escuchar lo que ustedes quieren ver en este nuevo centro. Un recordatorio que esta reunión está siendo grabada y estará disponible en nuestro sitio web. Si quieren saber ese link, me pueden también mandar un mensaje. Una vez más, bienvenidos y muchas gracias por estar aquí. Thank you, Marta. Um, great. Okay, let's uh, head back to the polls and just get an idea of, um, of some of the poll questions. Again, um, the majority of people have attended, um, you know, either one or both of the previous meetings. And um, do you usually visit Tilden Park with children or Tilden Nature Area with children? And it's 50-50. Some people are coming by themselves or with adults. Others are uh, with the children. It has a little something for everyone. And when was the last time you visited the Tilden Nature Center? Uh, we had in the last week, we had uh, several in the last month. Um, also several two to three months ago and one to four to six months ago. Uh, we have nobody that answered within the last year, more than a year or never. So these are all people that are familiar with the nature area and uh, the EEC. And um, we're, we're happy to have your input. Have any of the following circumstances created a barrier for you accessing the current visitor center? No bus service from the area. Yes, one person said that's a problem. Uh, no Wi-Fi or cellular service in the park is also a problem. Uh, for one person, um, parking and benches do not seem to be an issue for this group. Uh, the journey from the parking lot uh, is too far that is also not an issue for the group or that wheelchair access is limited. And uh, we did have one person reporting that uh, the visitor center entrance is not clearly marked. And that's something we will remedy for sure in any iteration of a new visitor center that we have. And um, many people reported that there are no barriers to access for themselves. Uh, so what sort of an interpretive feature would you be interested in at the new um, visitor center? That is a question and I um, trying to figure out how to view those answers. I'm skipping that one for the moment and we'll get back to it. I'm having a little bit of trouble viewing the writing answer portions. Um, so what part of the Tilden Nature Area's history are you interested in? 67% um, said the Native peoples and Ohlone culture. 50% said ranching history. 83% is interested in the creation of the East Bay Regional Park District and Tilden Nature Area. 67%. Uh, was interested in botanic changes related to the changing land use. And 67% said they were interested in the CCC or Civilian Conservation Corps and army presence that was in the park. Sarah, right. would you like me to um, go over some of the short answer write-ins? I, I would love that, thank you. I'm not able to see those. 
You're welcome. So uh, one of the questions was, what sort of interpretive features would you be interested in at the new visitor center? Um, we have a, a hands-on food web activity, a library, opportunities to talk with the naturalists, have field trips, hands-on activities, scaled watershed activities, another uh, suggestion for a library. Someone said, a history of the UC Berkeley impact on the origins and development of the park district. That's a good one. And a uh, model Ohlone habitat and aspects of daily life. Great. And then the last one was, what is one thing you would like to learn about in the visitor center? Uh, we have uh, the park, the Tilden Park itself, um, ecology of the plants and animals, um, what people think, think about the proposed design and how the watershed works. Fantastic. So thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for you guys uh, sharing your, your thoughts on that. And um, we appreciate the feedback. Yes, it's all really good stuff. And we look forward to really working some of these nuggets into our uh, design. Um, so at this time, I would love to introduce some of the folks that are presenting uh, tonight. Um, we have our district architect and project lead, Jim Devlin, who is here. And uh, from our EHDD architectural team, we have Ryan Metcalf and Chris Patano. And from our exhibit design firm, Aldrich Pears and Associates, we have Richard Lean, Alex Noble, and Scott Plum. And from our landscape architect firm, CMG, we have Lauren Stahl. Is there anybody that I missed tonight? Okay. All right, so with that, uh, Jim, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Okay, thank you. I'm having a little bit of problems now with the moving the slides again. Okay. So the, dis the district's objective for this project is to replace the existing Tilden EEC facility and exhibits with a new facility. The goals for that project is to one, is to build a complex that's fully integrated with its surrounding natural and cultural landscape. Or also another goal is to create a state-of-the-art education and exhibit experience that is inviting and accessible to all the public. And finally, a facility that reflects the district's commitment to sustainable and resili resilient design practices. <clears throat> I'm just going to go over here real quickly what is included in this project. Uh, the, fo the, the large photo is of the Tilden EEC structure, and that is the structure that we, are, we intend to replace. In the upper right-hand corner is a photo of the EEC facility, you'll see the pie-shaped building. That is the exhibit center that we're intending to replace. And adjacent to it, to the left, is the is a security residence that is also part of this project. To the right of that um, in that photo, in, is the adjacent Tilden Little Farm. And I just want to be clear with everyone that the Tilden Little Farm is not part of the scope of this project and will not be um, being altered or renovated um, during this project. Yeah. Got I need to find it. All right. I think I've got it. Wow. Mm. Seems to be a time delay on this. All right. Sorry. Sorry for that. Here I'm going to just go over the location of the, the project. It's um 
in Contra Costa County along its western border with Alameda County. The facility itself is located in the hills above the communities of Kensington and Berkeley. <clears throat> Here I'll go over the status of the project. Things that have been completed on this project to date are First, the feasib a feasibility study was conducted to determine whether to preserve the existing structure and renovate it or to replace it. It was decided in that study to replace it. We've con contracted the design consultants, the architectural design team of EHDD and CMG Landscape and Associate Engineers. And we've contracted the design consultant for the exhibit design, which will be Aldrich Pear and Associates. We've completed the pre-design phase for the building and site, and we've completed the pre-design phase for the exhibit design, and those were presented in previous community meeting. We've completed um, community meeting number one uh, and its on-site exhibit, which covered the pre-design phase. We, as far as the schematic design phase to date, we've completed the three building site plan options and we um, have started to develop the exhibit designs. Community meeting number two and its on-site exhibit um, is where we presented those three building site plan options. And we have completed also the selection of the preferred design option. And that's what we'll be pre presenting to you tonight. Um, so now we get to the portion of the work that's in process. Um, that's this meeting that we're at right now, the community meeting number three, where we talk about the design project and the project timeline. We also will be having an on-site exhibit at the Tilden EEC uh, Visitor Center, probably going up first of next week, which will be um, showing some of the highlights from this presentation. Then the next steps going forward um, will be the schematic design phase, where we'll develop a the preferred design option, and also continue to develop the exhibit design concepts. With that, I'm gonna turn it back to Sarah. All right, so for those of you that have been to the Tilda Nature area, which it seems like is most of you, uh, you know that it's a really very special place. It offers miles of trails to hike, peaks to climb, ponds and lakes to explore, group camping opportunities, and in keeping with the intent of the park as a nature study area, there are multi multitudes of beautiful places for wildlife viewing and uh, quiet contemplation. There's also an extremely popular little farm where I am happy to announce that we just had some new additions to the farm um, in the form of four baby lambs that were born in the last couple of days. So mazel tov to the ewes. And of course, at the very heart of this park is the Environmental Education Center, which serves as a meeting and orientation place for the public and provides educational exhibits and activities for all ages. And it houses the offices of the interpretive staff that provide programs to tens of thousands of visitors and school children each year. Uh, the mission of the East Bay Regional Parks Interpretive and Recreation Department, which is um, the department that uh, our staff and our park falls under, uh, the mission is to inspire East Bay residents to enjoy and value their regional parks through innovative programs and services that are educational, uplifting, and empowering. Um, so we take that to heart. And in order to meet this mission uh, with community programs and events, I'm sorry, we, we meet this mission with community programs and events, um, such as our Over the Hills Gang hikes that are geared for the 50 plus year community, uh, bilingual farm tours and bilingual programming, our junior ranger program, which has been running for about 80 years now and still going strong, and our Pride in the Park events. So with all of these fabulous programs, we are envisioning a visitor center that will enhance our programs and offer, an, offer even more opportunities to connect with all of the Bay Area residents here. And 
And um, with that, um, I believe we are going to send it over to EHDD uh, to talk about the architectural plans. Okay, Ryan. Yeah, that's right. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you, Jim. Oh, hold on. All right. Uh, my name is Ryan Metcalf. I'm an architect with EHDD, um, and I will be presenting the current status of the architectural design for the, the new Environmental Education Center. So the architectural goals for the new EEC uh, reflect the goals identified earlier by Jim um, for, the, for the district that have been stated from the beginning of the project. These not only address the present issues at the existing building, but they aim to allow the district to expand their reach to larger and broader audiences. So first off, the, the new EEC will be integrated. Uh, it'll create a, a new and legible entry experience to the Tilden Tilden Nature area. Uh, it'll be welcoming and will provide more direct connection to the little farm and to nearby park resources. And the new facility will consolidate and organize service access in a meaningful and intentional way. Uh, the new EEC will be inviting and accessible. So all public areas will be on a single level and access routes and the trails immediately around the building will all be accessible, uh, enhancing access across the entire site. Uh, the new Environmental Education Center will offer more daylight and visual connection out to the surrounding site, which has been an important factor in the development of this design. And lastly here, the, the new EEC will be sustainable and resilient. Uh, with a focus on improved building performance and site resource management. Uh, it'll take the baton from the existing building and carry its mission for the next 50 plus years. So as, as Jim alluded to in his um, kind of status of the project and, prog and progress of the project, um, in the previous community meeting, um, our team shared three architectural and landscape scheme options for the new EEC, which are um, represented here on the screen. Uh, each of these offered a different approach to arranging the individual components of the building on the site, and each suggested a different approach to the scale of the building elements. Following careful consideration by the district and others, one of these three schemes emerged as the preferred option. Um, you can see the green box around the one in the middle there. Um, this is what we had been referring to as scheme two or the branch scheme previously. One of the most significant strengths of this scheme is the way that it breaks down the building segments, similar in scale to the surrounding structures, for instance, the Ranger Lodge um, out back and the little farm structures just across the way. Pockets of existing, oh, sorry, pockets of exterior space are nestled uh, near the building, creating focused areas for gathering. And the scheme also provides an intriguing organization of the exhibit spaces, uh, allowing for cohesive yet specific experiences across the building. Can we jump one slide, please? Okay. Thank you. So uh, before going in a bit further on the, the new design, I think it's worthwhile to spend a little bit of time situating ourselves um, and looking at the existing conditions of the existing facility. As many of you are, are aware, the EEC is located at the center of a clearing, surrounded on three sides by a series of trails and service paths. The east, which is at the top of this drawing, uh, there's an open meadow and trails leading up into the hills. Security residents and staff parking are adjacent to the EEC over there to the north on the left here. And of course, uh, the little farm south is an important next door neighbor. Uh, most visitors arrive at the EEC via the parking lot and cross Wildcat Creek and continue along pathways that lead further into the into the tilt nature area, or they go up to the little farm, or they head into the EEC. And the entrance to the existing EEC, which is shown here with a red arrow, is oriented toward the pathway from the parking lot, but is turned away from the rest of the site including uh, the access from the little farm. So the EEC is a well-loved resource, as we all know, and it provides a delightful interior space at the central rotunda. 
But some of the issues facing the existing facility are that it does not meet current accessibility and um, building codes. Um, and the aforementioned entrance is not easily apparent for visitors to, uh, from the little farm. And the building's geometry creates some wedge-like rooms uh, which lack flexibility. And there's a lack of daylight and views to the site from within the building. On the next slide, we'll start to look at the the plan for the um for the new design here. Um, but yeah, taking a look at the plan for the new building, this design provides distinct experiences within the public areas. So the primary volume, which is running kind of to the left and right on this image, um, the primary volume includes the entrance, which is shown by that red arrow once again, um, and support functions, which include you know public restrooms, a reception desk ahead of you and the admin office spaces behind that. And intersecting axis includes the exhibit zones. So the, the exhibit space is located um, running east-west um, in that area that intersects with that main volume I just described. Uh, the entrance is oriented, welcome visitors arriving from the parking lot, as well as visitors coming from the little farm. And a generous sheltered entry plaza allows groups to gather just outside the entrance. Um, speaking of the exhibit space, there are three long distinct branches uh, that provide um, space for the interpretive themes. These zones are of a consistent width, they're about 20 feet, 28 feet across, and they run um, they run along the east-west axis, um, intersecting with that main northwest axis I described. And then two public gathering spaces are adjacent to the exhibit branches. And those are those um, those rooms that are um, Kind of tacked on to the exhibit areas on the south, on the southern and or entrance side. And administrative areas are located at the rear of the of the building, adjacent to a service yard to the far north. Um, and that service yard is accessed by a service route that runs along the northern edge of the site. There's a small shop structure that's located at, at the rear of the site as well, that's accessed from the service yard level. And the security residence is shown being renovated in its current location. So it's the, the, the structure you see at the slight angle at the bottom left of that of that plan. On the next slide, uh, we have a, a couple of site sections, which start to get at some of the relationships between the building and the site elements nearby. So each of these drawings is essentially cutting through the two primary axes of the building. The upper site section runs up to the north and south axis, showing the, the EEC's proximity to the little farm to the south, which is shown on the right there, um, and the service road to the north. So from the right to the left on that top image, you can see the entry plaza sheltered by the extended roof overhang, the entry lobby and the restroom block, and then the reception desk, which is located in the middle of the building. The office areas are located behind the reception and have access to the service yard behind the EEC. That's also the area that includes the shop building and the security residence. The lower site section runs through the east-west exhibit wing. So the central reception area is again shown in the center there, and it's flanked on either side by exhibits that branch out to the east and to the west. So exhibits located towards the east um, on the right hand side of the drawing, have a view out towards the forest uphill, and exhibits located toward the west, which is on the left of this drawing, have a view toward Wildcat Creek down below. Now on the next couple of slides, we wanted to we wanted to include some initial visualizations of the massing and character of the new building in progress. Now, please note, um, these are intended to illustrate essentially the scale and the siding location of the building, but they do not yet suggest building materials or landscape elements. Um, looking at the exterior of the building, these two views approximate the two primary ways of approaching the building. So on the left, that's the view from essentially from the parking lot having cro just crossed the creek. And then on the right, that would be the view after you've exited the little farm with the cow barn kind of poking out there on the right. 
The primary public spaces, including the lobby and the exhibit area, are sheltered by gable roofs. So these, these roof forms are pretty common and familiar in this context, but they're also inviting forms that reference existing park structures nearby, for instance, you know, the Ranger Lodge and some of the little farm agricultural structures. And the secondary public spaces, that includes the two public gathering rooms that um, are located nearby. Those are smaller box-like volumes that sit below the height of the adjacent gable roofs. And just, just for reference, if anybody's curious, uh, the gable roof of the primary axis, um, that's at the main entry, that currently extends up to about 30 feet high and the intersecting exhibit gable roofs go out to about 25 feet there. On the next slide, we have a couple of um, images to pair with the exterior views. These are, again, some rough um, early views of some of the interior qualities of the space. So the intersection of these roof forms creates a generous and airy space at the center of the building near the reception area seen um, here in these two interior views. And this central space is not entirely unlike the open area of the existing Environmental Education Center building, where we have the um, the generous volume at the reception area at the center. As you'll notice, um, exposed structure throughout this area articulates the resulting geometries of these intersect intersecting volumes, and it may demonstrate a compelling sustain sustainability approach where we're repurposing material from the existing building and the new structure. And also expansive views out to the surrounding site are provided as a backdrop for exhibits in these areas. And the image on the right, you can see the the western view toward Wildcat Creek. And in this exhibit space, the idea is that it would focus on the Wildcat Creek watershed just beyond. So that's a bit of a sampling of the existing architectural design. Does that wrap it up, Ryan? I believe so. OK, we'll go into. Um the exhibit design being presented by, I believe, Richard, are you going to be the one to start it? Uh, yes. Can okay. you hear me? I just switched my, my earbuds here. Yes. yes. Terrific. Um, hey, um, and welcome and thank you for attending um, this evening. Uh, my name is Richard Lean. I'm a, I'm a partner at Aldridge Parents Associates. Uh, our Aldridge Parents Associates are uh, interpretive planners and exhibit designers. And we're working in collaboration with uh, Architects EHDD, as you just met Ryan, and uh, you'll uh, following our uh, sec uh, session or segment, you'll be uh, meeting Lauren with the CMG Landscape Architects, and we're working with again Ryan and Lauren in collaboration on the development of this uh, project. Um, uh, I'm the exhibit uh, design team's project manager, and this evening I'm joined by Alex, uh, Alex Noble, and Scott Plum. You know, Alex is an associate with Aldrich Pairs Associates. Uh, she's an interpretive planner uh, and an exhibit developer, and and Scott is our lead designer, leading the kind of the creative um, uh, development of the work, um, as we're going to be sharing with you this evening. So, Alex is going to start us off. She's going to be uh, kind of walking us through what you see on screen, some of the Kind of the interpretive foundation that we've developed in collaboration with uh, the team at the uh, current Tilden EEC, all the terrific uh, Sarah and her team of naturalists and other uh, kind of uh, dedicated folks with the um, regional park district. Um, a few of them, of course, are on the call this evening. Um, uh, Scott's going to follow Alex um, and. Uh, yeah, share work in progress development of some of the preliminary exhibit ideas, which we're looking forward to sharing with you some uh, some some general kind of overview of floor plans uh, and kind of e exhibit and visitor experiences. So, uh, with that, I'm just going to hand it over to Alex. Thanks, Richard. I'm going to start by talking about some of the basic principles um, of the exhibit design. Our work here is really to figure out what people will experience at the new visitor center. Um, but the starting point really for that is to define a big idea. And for those of you who've been on the previous community um, calls, this will be a recap for you, but for anybody who wasn't, uh, I just wanna make sure that we're all starting on the same page. So I'm gonna review it again. Um, 
So these big ideas really we're trying to get at if visitors take away one thing when they leave, what will that be? And then what are the other key points that support that big idea? Uh, these are really the foundation on which all those exhibits are created. And this slide really tries to capture that framework of ideas. The big idea, um, we're calling it the overarching theme for the new visitor center is the dynamic Wildcat Creek watershed embodies dramatic changes that define the landscapes, the values, and the natural and cultural ecosystem of the East Bay. Supporting that are four sub-themes. The first one is, through time, the watershed has been a homeland, a source of sustenance, a commercial water supply, grazing land, a eucalyptus plantation, flood hazard, and a place of refuge and recreation. The second one is plants and animals reveal their roles and relationships within our changing ecosystem. The third is Wildcat Creek carves and shapes the land and provides rich and varied habitat for many plant and animal species. The fourth one is people have a role to play in the health of this ecosystem from personal to policy levels. Some of you keen, keen uh, watchers here might notice that we've updated the first sub theme uh, to include the idea of homeland uh, to really bring forward the stories of Ohlone peoples, uh, which is a, a really an important aspect of the visitor center. And we had some uh, feedback at the, the last couple of meetings um, that really made us realize that uh, we need to make sure that that's clear in the thematic structure as well so that it carries through all the exhibits. Um, so these themes and the theme and sub theme really are supposed to be touchstones that capture what's special and important about Tilden. Um, and then we'll continue to revisit them as we, as we move forward in the project. We can move to the next slide. This is a diagram that captures uh, our understanding of how all the topics covered by the themes and sub themes nest together. So at the heart of the story is this place, um, specifically uh, on a micro level, uh, at one eddy or one water body that's nestled in the in in uh, the middle of Tilden Nature Area. So we can explore the plant and animal communities that live in that water body and how it sustains them. And then we want to move outwards, looking at the broader nature area, which communities live here, um, which species can we get to know, how do people interact with and impact this place, uh, both you know, looking to the past and the present and the future. Then we look a little further outward, we look at the bigger picture of the Wildcat Creek watershed. How does the watershed as a system support wildlife? How does it support migration? What do we see all along the path of the watershed? What are the connections between the headwaters and the bay? And then how do people work together across that watershed to support nature? And then the biggest picture um, um, that we wanna look at is the park district and questions of land use. How have people cho um, chosen over time to interact with land in this region? So that would include Ohlone relationships to the land. It would look at, it would include ranching, it would include recreation. So inviting visitors to really explore the impacts of our choices and um, apply some critical thinking skills to, to their own choices. So running through these connected stories are threads that encourage visitors to view the watershed from different perspectives. So what does a naturalist see when they look at the watershed? What would an Ohlone person see when they look at some of these topics? Um, what does an individual species perceive as, uh, as, as significant? What would a conservationist uh, think about some of these ideas? So we wanna really um, expand people's thinking so that they look at things from multiple points of view and multiple perspectives. Okay, you can go to the next slide, please. This uh, diagram gives us a, uh, a sense of the relationships um, bet um, uh, between the parts of the journey that visitors are having at the visitor center. And in fact, looking at 
their journey throughout the site. So they go through different stages on their, during their visit, they arrive, they decompress, they um, need to be oriented to place. Um, and then they have a, an interpretive um, experience, which includes lots of different kinds of experience. They connect, they touch things, they explore, they reflect, they play. Um, and then we really wanted to look for opportunities to link that interpretation inside the visitor center with what's happening on the exterior. So this was an important um, um, idea that uh, helped us work with EHDD and CMG to, um, to come up with a plan that was going to really integrate the indoor and outdoor uh, experience. Okay, next uh, slide. Sorry, hold on a second. And this is the last slide I'm going to talk about. Um, so from uh, from those conceptual diagrams, we started to look into uh, how might these exhibit themes and these ideas mesh with the building scheme. Um, this shows a series of bubbles. Each of the different colors uh, represents one exhibit area. And this is overlaid onto the building plan. So it shows how some of the themed content relates to the building. Uh, Ryan mentioned some of this in his presentation too. We've got uh, one wing that really looks at Wildcat Creek and that uh, story is integrated with um, views out towards the creek itself. Um, the section that's looking at woodlands is visually and um, physically linked to the outdoor spaces that are adjacent to the forested areas. Um, so we've worked really hard to make sure that the ideas that are being interpreted inside are connected to the, the site here. Um, on a high level, as visitors <clears throat> pass through each of these, these spaces, um, the, the orientation area is where they enter the building. This is where they're oriented to what's happening in the park and to the district. Um, in the reception area, they're introduced to the big ideas of the visitor center um, and they'll encounter opportunity then through different perspectives. From here, they have a free choice uh, exploration. So they may choose to go left, they may choose to go right. Uh, either way, they'll have a, a mix of experiences. And the two main zones are Wildcat Creek and the, the woodland zone. Uh, there's also a chance to dive into the history of parklands and land use here in this um, parkland section. And then the reflection area is a place where visitors can decompress and recollect um, uh, and um, reflect on their visit with, with uh, whoever they're, they're visiting with. That's a really rough, uh, a really, really basic um, breakdown of their journey through this space. From here, I'm gonna pass the baton to Scott so he can share more ideas about what, what visitors could um, do and see and hear uh, in the visitor center. Thanks very much, Alex. Um, Jim, you can move us along to the next slide. I am going to be um, going through each of those bubbles that Alex just shared with you in a little bit more detail. Um, and we're going to start here with, of course, um, the orientation. And uh, just to back up a little bit, um, Alex was talking about the visitor journey, of course, doesn't start right at the door. People don't just magically appear there. Um, they go through a process of arrival um, lower down on the site near the parking lot, and they cross over the creek, uh, that's sort of our decompression zone, and then they approach the building through the landscaping, which we'll hear more about uh, following this, um, and arrive in the sort of uh, covered entry plaza area before they pass into this uh, lobby, which is um, what we're calling orientation. And there's a variety of things, of course, going on. There's, you know, the usual washrooms, um, but there's also the stories of um, the, con con sorry, the uh, context of the East Bay Regional Park. So there'll be on the right hand side, there would be um, brochures and maps that you can explore to understand um, the park district in a broader sense. 
Uh, over on the left, we where we feature uh, Explore Tilden, that's a place where there's a more detailed map, of course, of the Tilden nature area, and you can get updates on programming and events uh, around the area. Uh, there's also a space we've set aside for an Ohlone welcome. Um, and then if you go to the right, uh, top right there, there is um, a familiar piece of the, the existing visitor center, which is a large sculptural wooden uh, mountain lion. Uh, so we're planning on putting that also in the reception space as a touchstone to the incredible heritage um, this um, interpretive center has. And it'll be in the context probably of a, a map highlighting uh, things like mountain lion range and routes through Tilden. So that's your initial um, orientation as a visitor when you arrive. Uh, and as previously, previously mentioned, you move from that space into what we're calling reception, which is our next slide. And uh, looking at these bu the bubbles we've got here, uh, we highlighted um, three bubbles. One, uh, if we start on the left-hand side, is a uh, anim uh, sorry ambassador animal habitat uh, where visitors might uh, meet indigenous snakes or lizards and learn to appreciate them from uh, multiple perspectives. So that kind of ties back in with the interpretive um, approach Alex was talking about earlier about different perspectives and how would um, how would a naturalist see something? How would an Ohlone um, visitor's point of view be or um, a rancher or different perspectives. Uh, there is a bubble, the next bubble just above that is reception. And that's really the key touch point where visitors get to connect with naturalists, ask questions, find out what's going on. Um, and it's just to the right of it, the next bubble we have, um, historic naturalist desk and be a naturalist station. This is a, a really important extension really of the receptionist uh, reception space. And it's um, where we begin to really share the role of the naturalists uh, in the park and give them an opportunity, of course, to share all the wonderful things they experience uh, on a day, daily, hourly basis within the park. So there's station there. Um, where you can touch and study different um, featured specimens from around the park. There might be a bird's nest or a, a shed snake skin or an unusual pine cone with a story behind it. There's opportunities to settle down um, with some paper and colored pencils, maybe draw or trace some diagrams of specimens. Um, and behind it is the historic naturalist desk where we um, have a recreated sort of 1950s um, naturalist desk. Uh, gives you a touch point into um, the heritage and explore old photographs, um, old interpretive um, models and things like that. Because um, as uh, Sarah pointed out, there is a really long history of interpretation in the park through naturalists and of course the, uh, the junior rangers. Um, from here, uh, we have uh, visitors have an option of continuing to the left, which goes to what Ryan referred to earlier as sort of the watershed area or it's our wild cat creek, or you can uh, continue on to the right and either go into woodlands or the reflect gallery. So it's kind of a central hub. If we go on to the next slide, uh, it'll give us an opportunity to uh, explore the, um, the woodlands gallery. And uh, here there, or sorry, the uh, the park, uh, park history uh, gallery is actually what we have next. Um, this is a story that relates very much to um, the naturalists and the interpretive center that we have today. Um, it's all about the, um, the history of um, East Bay Regional Park District. And there's currently in the visitor center a very large historic topographic um, model of the park, which will find a new home here. And it'll be surrounded by an artifact wall with a mix of um, ephemera and artifacts from throughout the history of the district. Uh, there's also an opportunity in the middle of that green bubble just towards the top uh, where it says nature of change. There might be a sort of sit down 
role playing game where you can um, explore the development of East Bay. You can play different roles, be a developer, be a conservationist, a rancher, a politician, uh, and make decisions and see what kind of impacts and outcomes um, there are related to those different roles and uh, the associated perspectives. And we could probably move on to the next slide. So this is um, the watershed uh, space, and it's really all about Wildcat Creek. Um, if you, if we sort of start perhaps looking at this from, um, let's say at 12 o'clock at the very top, there's a long wall called Day in the Life um, Wildcat Creek. And it's an opportunity to experience the park um, in a sensory level throughout the day, different times of day, dawn, through to dusk, through the night, uh, find out what's happening with the plants and the animals and uh, in the park. So there would be um, a feature of um, trail cam footage on video, for instance, something like that, where you would see bobcats or other animals that have been uh, caught on the trail cams. Um, there's an opportunity to sit down into a little nook where there's a soundscape. Um, it has audio that follows through sort of a loop of uh, the uh, course of a day. So you hear dawn chorus and birds, sounds of the creek, frogs, that kind of thing. Um, it's an opportunity to share and experience the park at times of day, perhaps when visitors are less likely to be there. Uh, centrally, located in this gallery sort of is of course a uh, very prominent um, watershed model it's a tactile model of the entire watershed uh, one side is a uh, fully accessible unobstructed physical access for people with audio hotspots that call out physical features in the watershed um, there is also opportunities for lots of little interactive uh, moments around the perimeter um, to understand and uh, explore different perspectives of the watershed. Um, just below that, it's sort of the six o'clock position. There is um, the water, what we're calling the water wall for now. And it is a great opportunity for live species uh, aquariums featuring things like trout, newt, potentially turtles. Um, there'll be a nearby micro eye station, um, an opportunity to explore things on a microscopic scale related to uh, watershed and water quality. Um, and to the left of all this, of course, we have this large window that, as what Ryan said, offers great views uh, out to Wildcat Creek, uh, kind of um, westward, where we have um, potentials for connecting to outdoor interpretation um, developed in with between ourselves and the, uh, the landscape uh, design firm CMG. Let's go on to the next slide and try to keep things moving. Um, we have the reflect space. Um, I think the name says a lot, but we're talking about a a place for um, getting out of the, the buzz and the activity of the rest of the uh, visitor center, sitting down, uh, in a beanbag chair or a nice comfortable chair, looking out the large uh, windows, appreciating the uh, the forest views. Um, you can uh, take a seat in a comfortable chair, and you might be surprised to hear the sounds of bird song or loney music uh, or some other element. There's also opportunities to connect with friends and loved ones. Um, chairs could be facing each other. They could be independent as well as group opportunities in the top left corner. There's a kind of a nook for drawing and journaling. So you might pick up a, something uh, at one of the naturalist stations and bring it over there, sit down and, and sketch out a pine cone or um, look at things from a different perspective. And another key component we have here, which I heard about in the comments uh, in the poll we did earlier is a, a library. Uh, we want to have a nice little library, low sensory space to pick up and explore books. Uh, but the park um, and animals and plants and the history of the park. And if we continue on, we'll go on to the next slide here. Um, 
these bubbles are all of our uh, woodlands space. And um, if we start kind of in the top left bubble, if you will, where it says be a naturalist, that's one of our, our naturalist stations, which is uh, going to have specimens and seasonally updated, or maybe weekly or daily updated uh, components related to things going on around the park. They might find us, you know, an interesting specimen and want to give some information on that. Um, it's uh, an opportunity for visitors when they, they come, they're going to see new and different things there uh, each time they come and visit the park. There could be um, also a butterfly sort of chrysalis terrarium along that wall, smell stations to explore the odors of different times of year, different plants uh, visitors might encounter. Uh, further along that wall as we're crossing along the top, uh, it sort of transitions into uh, um, this concept of garden and pharmacy, which talks about um, learning how to garden with indigenous plants, learning about what's traditionally, historically, culturally relevant for lonely people. There might be a hands-on grinding of acorns um, activity. Um, and then as you travel around further clockwise, of course, you have the large windows with views uh, out towards the woodlands, uh, the, the trees out there. Centrally in the space is uh, a large sculptural uh, nurse log. Uh, where you get to meet the community, uh, meet all the plants, some of the, some of the plants and the animals that are they call this um, this place home. Uh, it's great if it's a, something that you can explore from the outside as well as crawl through to the inside. So it has a lot of little touch uh, points along the way. You might um, make music using sounds of the forest, uh, untangle a food web, understand your role and your place uh, in the food web. Um, you might look at small little specimens or models of different creatures that you don't see every day, uh, the things that live under logs, or if you lift them up, what might be living under there. And on the, the very bottom uh, portion of this gallery, there is uh, a bubble labeled wood rat nest, which is um, a very hands-on full-bodied experience where you can be a wood rat and you can climb and play inside an oversized wood rat nest. Um, it's and nearby adjacent to that is of course some some seating where um, people can sit down and have a look outside the window um, and just enjoy the view. That's kind of a, like a quick tour of some of the preliminary ideas and exciting things that we've got uh, under development for visitors and their experience to the, the new uh, visitor center. Okay. Uh, with that, Thank think... you very much, Scott. Mm -hmm, no um, I would love if we could take a moment and see if there's any questions at this time. Uh, we're not having much coming in on the Q&A, but I just wanted to give an opportunity. That was a lot of information and uh, really fabulous stuff. I'm so excited about this project. Um, but I thought if anybody had any questions, now would be a great time to put those into the Q&A. All right, well, all right, it looks like there is one question in here. There was a whiteboard at the entrance to the visitor center that would allow park staff and visitors to communicate with one another about what they experienced during their visit. Will this continue as an aspect of the design? Uh, if I, I were to be answering that, <laughs> I would say uh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, we will be having um, those personal connection um, uh, touch places throughout the visitor center um, in potentially in the entrance part, but also in the reflection area to allow people to reflect on uh, what they experienced in the park uh, that day, 
uh, and in the past as well. Did anybody have anything they want to add to that? It's just it's a great a great idea, and we make a note of it. You know, it's a wonderful idea. Sarah, we also got a question in um, through the chat. Uh, says, are there specific outdoor exhibits under consideration? Thank you. And we will be doing our uh, outdoor um, uh, presentation in just a moment. Um, but um, I can answer that a little bit now, Sarah. Okay, great. Thank you, yeah, Lauren. I'm, I'm Lauren Saw. I'm a landscape architect with CMG, and I'll talk about the kind of landscape of the entire site in a moment. But to speak directly, I actually don't cover the interpretive elements super clearly. My presentation is partially because they're still under development. And so we're working with APA to figure out um, exactly what we're going to have. And I'll touch on that a little bit. But there, we have been discussing having some of the elements from the inside carry to the out. So there will be certain, you know, outside of the watershed wing, there will be outdoor exhibits about the watershed in addition to what you're seeing inside and same with the woodlands there'll be you know outdoor exhibits that correspond with that so the idea is that yes as you explore the landscape around the environmental education center there will be opportunities to learn about the plants and the animals and the cultural history and the alone history of the place thank you All right, I don't see any other questions. So um, Lauren, if you are ready, I'll let you take it away. Sure. As I just said, my name is Lauren Stahl. I'm a landscape architect with CMG, um, and we are delighted to be working on the Tilden Environmental Education Center and to be working with the Park District and the other designers uh, to reimagine what this place can be. So what you're seeing on the screen is the latest version of the landscape plan. Um, there are two kind of major differences. There's a lot of a lot of differences, but two major differences between the current um, what's out there now and what you're seeing in this plan. Um, first is to streamline the entry. We're showing a new bridge over Wildcat Creek um, over the siltation pond. So instead of walking down the Wildcat Creek Trail. Um, visitors will walk right from the turnaround across the bridge over the creek and then right to the front door of the Environmental Education Center. Um, so there's one arch path that takes you to the Environmental Education Center. And then if you loop around, um, there'll be a second path that creates an accessible route over to the Little Farm, since currently there isn't a um, kind of path to the Little Farm that meets accessibility code. The second big change on the site is that currently the Environmental Education Center sits in the middle of a large lawn area. And I think as most people know, lawns are water intensive and they actually have pretty minimal habitat value. And so this landscape plan, the new Environmental Education Center will be surrounded by mostly native plantings. Uh, and this plan will create much more habitat for native bugs and for birds and provides educational value to the landscape around the center. We do have two lawn areas. So we include one kind of off the front door and one in the back. Um, uh, and those are just places you know, to have events or for kids to play or for families to relax. Um, but reducing the amount of lawn overall, it lowers both the water use and the maintenance associated with the lawn, and it also increases the ecological value of the site, and so we see that kind of being a win-win. So in addition to those kind of main changes, we have five outdoor classrooms on the site, so those are really just meant for places to gather um, where there could be a naturalist program or where you could kind of go and sit, um, and then we also have an amphitheater. And so each of the outdoor classrooms will be themed, I think, to talk a little bit about the kind of educational or interpretive program outside. So each of those outdoor classrooms will be themed. Um, there will have one you know, dedicated to pollinators, um, and then we'll have one explaining the kind of hydrology and flow of water on the site. And so these areas will be used by school groups and for naturals programs, but they can also just be places that visitors can kind of explore, rest, and learn. Um, and then in addition to that, there are secondary pathways above and below the Environmental Education Center that link to the outdoor classrooms and the various trailheads um, around the EEC. And these paths will all be accessible for people in wheelchairs or families with strollers. 
And then we also have some staff support areas and parking, which has been moved. It's currently off of the Wildcat Creek Trail, um, and it's been located to the north side of the EEC along the Loop Road. So next. And I think to show this a little bit more clearly, as I described in my previous slide, with the new design, the bridge is how most visitors will get to the EEC. So you'll go straight from the turnaround, you'll cross the bridge, and then you'll walk to the front door of the center or onto the little farm. Uh, we're still accessible uh, as a team. We're still kind of assessing the feasibility of the bridge based on the kind of geotechnical soil conditions, maintenance access requirements, and cost. Um, so we're still kind of making sure that that's all going to work. Um, but if you go on to the next slide, if the bridge is not feasible, we'll update the plan to look like this. So um, the existing pathway that's currently um, parallel to Wildcat Creek will be rebuilt to meet accessibility code, and then we'll have a new winding path that will lead visitors up to the front door of the Environmental Education Center. Um, this option is not preferred just because it requires visitors. You have to descend down from the level of the turnaround to cross the creek and then go back up to the level of the Environmental Education Center. So it's a longer route and there's more change in elevation. So um, it makes it more difficult for some visitors to get to the Environmental Education Center. But either in either case, whether we have the bridge or we have this plan, um, the route would be updated to meet accessibility codes. So it would be an improvement over the current kind of site conditions. And go on to the next one. Um, I'll walk through the kind of various areas of the site in a little bit more detail. Um, so the turnaround, the existing turnaround will be rebuilt. It's a little bit too steep right now to meet code. Um, so it will be regraded and repaved. And we're gonna be adding new sidewalks to safely kind of separate pedestrians from vehicles. Um, the Wildcat Creek Trail will also be updated for, um, that's the fire access route, so it'll be updated but to ensure um, fire access and then clear connections to the upper and lower pack rat trails. And then you can see there the bridge that would be crossing the creek um, over to the Environmental Education Center. Go on to the next. I like to think of this area as the front yard of the EEC, so it's kind of the front, the front door and the kind of lawn out front. Um, so as I mentioned, that pathway from the bridge leads you up to the door um, and then over to the little farm. And then at right at the front door is a plaza. So it's, it'll be a welcome plaza. It's kind of a first point of arrival for visitors to the center. And it will have one of the outdoor classrooms there. And that can act as a first gathering spaces for classrooms or families coming to the center. And the plaza is supposed to be, it's intended to be an inviting place. There'll be seating. There's some covered space under the roof eaves um, and it'll incorporate interpretive elements as well. And then that right next to that plaza is a large lawn for events or for playing. And then that is surrounded by um, planting that supports pollinators. And then we have a second outdoor classroom at the back of the lawn. Um, and that outdoor classroom we're imagining being um, made of logs. We're hoping to get some logs that are being salvaged from some tree removals that will be happening in children nature area. In, as much as possible, we'll be reusing those in some of the site elements. And go on to the next. Um, so as I mentioned, all around the landscape, there will be interpretive elements um, like signs or you know little statues or things. So um, we're hoping you know there'll be places where visitors can learn about the environment even when the center is closed or for visitors who choose not to go inside. Um, so there are these two loop paths that I mentioned, one below the center and one above the center. And so these will both you know will have kind of various elements along these loops. Um, this lower. Uh, area of the site you'll see also has some of the largest stormwater treatment planting areas on the site and these areas are essential uh, green infrastructure so they remove contaminants from any stormwater that are coming off either the parking areas or off the building roof um, we are integrating these into part of the watershed interpretive story so it'll be kind of a unique visitor experience that as you come outside or as you walk along that loop you'll be able to con learn about the stormwater treatment and see the flow of water through the landscape. Um, right next to that, you'll see uh, is the staff parking and service area. Um, it's screen, it'll be screened by topography and planting and some fencing. 
Um, I know the area looks really big. It's sized based on um, the number of vehicles that we need to have for the staff and for maintenance. Um, it's also sized based on a fire access requirement. So this area is the main fire, fire staging area for the entire site. So in the event of an emergency, this is where the kind of fire trucks would be. Um, so we're going to do our best to keep this area screened and separated from the visitor experience, but we're also looking at ways to reduce the amount of impervious surface. So looking at things like pervious pavement um, to kind of limit the amount of runoff coming off the site. Um, and then as mentioned, in addition to the staff support areas, we also have the residents and that will have a kind of small fenced in yard for the staff living at the residence. Next. So this is um, kind of the upper part of the Environmental Education Center. Um, the large windows at the end of the woodland exhibit wing will look out onto planting into trees. And then next to that, like next to the building is a small plaza with an outdoor classroom. Uh, and then near there, there's also an amphitheater. It'll be um, kind of sized to seat about 50 people and will also be quite rustic. It will potentially be made out of salvaged wood from the site if we can get enough. Um, and then there is a lawn space for events and for play. And then we have the last outdoor classroom kind of at the highest point of the site. Um, and we're showing right now kind of a circular kind of boulder seating area for people. Uh, next. And then the planting on site will be kind of a microcosm of the park. And so we'll be including plants from the various ecosystems within Tilden Nature Area. And all of the plants will be selected and arranged based on the site conditions, but we're also going to be looking at uh, anticipated future conditions due to climate change. Um, all plants will be selected in consultation with the naturalists. And while most plants will actually be you know, very local Bay Area native species, we may be looking to central uh, the central coast or Southern California for potentially more drought or heat tolerant planting. Um, just anticipating that as the climate warms, those may be the types of plants that will do better here. Um, the plants will be also arranged in ecotypes across the site, and you can see that kind of with the various colors on the um, diagram. So we'll have riparian or kind of uh, creek planting in the lower areas, and then up to kind of oak savanna or woodland planting on the higher ends of the site. Um, so the purple areas will be what we call riparian or kind of riverside planting. Um, so we're going to you know, really work to minimize any uh, work around the creek, but if there's disturbance from kind of building the bridge or regrading of the access, pa uh, access paths, those areas will be replanted with appropriate um, riparian species. And then the stormwater treatment areas that we'll be using are also a place to showcase woodland or riparian plants. The kind of pinkish color that's just below that um, is a redwood uh, understory planting. So there are a bunch of existing redwoods on the site and we'll be um, leaving those in place. And then we'll be planting understory plants like ferns um, around the trees to demonstrate a typical redwood understory. The orange area near the front lawn, it will be pollinator planting. And so um, we want to showcase native plants that support um, pollinators like native bees and butterflies, hummingbirds and bats. And those pollinators are vital parts of both our natural um, and our agricultural system. So it kind of provides an interpretive gateway between the Environmental Education Center and the Little Farm site. Um, the yellow area around the rear lawn, we're showing as uh, you know some patches of meadow surrounding that um, that lawn. Um, the East Bay Hills were kind of characterized by grasslands um, historically, um, and so we will like to. Um, include a lot of those species on the site. Um, unfortunately, when you plant meadows, they're really, they require a really high level of maintenance to prevent the establishment of invasive species. So um, we'll have to kind of limit that area since um, they're kind of a little bit tricky. And then the green areas will be woodland or um, native oaks. So the California native oaks are really important species, both environmentally and culturally. And so we'll be planting some new oak trees and then understory that goes well with those um, kind of around them. So uh, we're very excited to be working with the Tilden Naturalists on this and we see so much opportunity to take, you know, what's there with the lawns and increase the biodiversity in the landscape. And I think with that, that's the last slide. So I think we are happy to answer any more questions that anyone might have. Thank you, Lauren. Um, 
Any questions, anybody? We are here for you. I don't see anything coming in. We can still answer them um, if they do come in in a little bit. Um, but for now, we will turn it over to Jim. Okay, this is where I can <clears throat> talk about the next steps. As you can see, we're, we're getting towards the end of our schematic design process. Um, we'll be developing this preferred building in site design option. We'll be developing the elevations and the materials uh, for the building. We'll also be developing the ex exhibit design concepts and the landscape plan. Then we will have a final schematic design, which we will uh, pr be presenting in a online, sorry, on-site exhibit at the EEC. And that will bring the schematic design phase to a close. And then um, we will, at that point, develop um, cost estimates of the project and then determine the next steps after we've concluded this stage. So this is the final of the um, slide of the presentation. Are there any questions? Um, just want to remind you for more information and opportunity to comment on the project, please go to the project website and visit our, and or visit our on-site exhibit. Um, so, you know, maybe something comes up tomorrow about that. Oh, I wish I'd asked that question. You know, be sure to come to our website and, um, you know, participate with questions or also any comments that you or suggestions you have. And with that, I want to thank everyone participating. And once again, we open it up to questions. Jim, there is one question. It says, uh, could the treatment ponds be interconnected to, sim uh, to simulate a tributary drainage toward the creek? Or are you considering these as simply wet depressions? I can answer that one. Um, yes, we actually have been discussing ways of having potentially having them connected and then potentially connected to the kind of at least visually connected to the indoor exhibits. Um, I really I do kind of love that idea of trying to simulate the tributary drainage. And so that is something that we're looking at doing. Um, obviously, working with the civil engineer, since these are not just, um, you know, they're not just interpretive elements, they're infrastructure. And so they need to work as well. So we're kind of working in conjunction with them trying to figure out how to kind of do the best of both. Thank you, Lauren. I don't see any other questions in the question and answer area, and I haven't received any more by chat. So unless any more pop in in just the next few moments, I think that we are probably good to go. Great. And I want to thank everybody so much for participating. As you know, the EC is an iconic building that we've been loving for generations, but it needs replacing. Um, so we're looking to create a new place that's equally beloved, a place that's inclusive and accessible for all communities with cutting edge and thought provoking environmental exhibits and uh, a place that's so inviting that people return to time and time again. Um, so we do want your input. Use that QR code. Come to the EEC and talk to us and give us your ideas. And um, let's make this a fabulous visitor center. Thank you so much. And um, I hope you have a wonderful night.